This podcast looks at the prophecy that is uh, written down in Daniel chapter 2. Now this is one of the most comprehensive, probably the most comprehensive prophecies in Scripture. And um, it's remarkable because you can trace down the Bible story with one hand and the Encyclopedia Britannica with the other and see how they fit together. And uh, you'll see in just a minute how that goes. Um, the setting is uh, somewhere around 600 BC. Daniel has been carried off in captivity to Babylon from Jerusalem, he and a bunch of other young guys, to be educated in Babylonian universities for administrative positions in Nebuchadnezzar's empire. And uh, during, uh, during this time, um, some interesting events take place surrounding a dream that King Nebuchadnezzar has. Here's the scripture. One night during the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had such disturbing dreams that he couldn't sleep. He called in his magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers, and he demanded that they tell him what he had dreamed. As they stood before the king, he said, I have had a dream that deeply troubles me, and I must know what it means. Then the astrologers answered the king in Aramaic, Long live the king, tell us the dream, and we will tell you what it means. But the king said to the astrologers, I'm serious about this. If you don't tell me what my dream was and what it means, you will be torn limb from limb and your houses will be turned into heaps of rubble. But if you tell me what I dreamed and what the dream means, I will give you many wonderful gifts and honors. Just tell me the dream and what it means. They said again, please, your majesty, tell us the dream and we will tell you what it means. I suppose, you know, if you were a magician or an astrologer, you were good at making up meanings for something. And if you could just get the dream, you could come up with almost any meaning. But the king replied, I know what you're doing. You're stalling for time because you know I'm serious when I say if you don't tell me the dream, you are doomed. So you have conspired to tell me lies, hoping I will change my mind. But tell me the dream, and then I'll know that you can tell me what it means. The astrologers replied to the king, no one on earth can tell the king his dream. And no king, however great and powerful, has ever asked such a thing of any magician, enchanter, or astrologer. The king's demand is impossible. No one except the gods can tell you your dream, and they do not live here among people. The king was furious when he heard this, and he ordered that all the wise men of Babylon be executed. And because of the king's decree, men were sent to find and kill Daniel and his friends. When Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, came to kill them, Daniel handled the situation with wisdom and discretion. He asked Arioch, why has the king issued such a harsh decree? So Arioch told him all that had happened. Daniel went at once to see the king and requested more time to tell the king what the dream meant. Then Daniel went home and told his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, what had happened. He urged them to ask the God of heaven to show them his mercy by telling them the secret so that they would not be executed, along with the other wise men of Babylon. That night the secret was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven. He said, Praise the name of God forever and ever, for he has all wisdom and power. He controls the course of world events. He removes kings and sets up other kings. Now, by the way, i just pause here for a minute. Um, you know, an ancient emperor, an ancient king, was the highest power that anybody could imagine. And for Daniel to suggest that his god was more powerful than Nebuchadnezzar was not only to suggest that, but also to suggest that Daniel's god was more powerful than Nebuchadnezzar's god. Daniel continues, he gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the scholars. He reveals deep and mysterious things and knows what lies hidden in darkness. Though he is surrounded by light, I thank and praise you, God of my ancestors, for you have given me wisdom and strength. You have told me what we asked of you and revealed to us what the king demanded. Then Daniel went in to see Arioch, whom the king had ordered to execute the wise men of Babylon. Daniel said to him, don't kill the wise men. Take me to the king and I will tell him the meaning of his dream. Arioch quickly took Daniel to the king and said, I have found one of the captives from Judah who will tell the king the meaning of his dream. The king said to Daniel, also known as Belteshazzar, that was his Babylonian name, Is this true? Can you tell me what my dream was and what it means? Daniel replied, There are no wise men, enchanters, magicians, or fortune tellers who can reveal the king's secret. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the future. Now I will tell you your dream and the visions you saw as you lay on your bed. 
While your majesty was sleeping, you dreamed about coming events. He who reveals secrets has shown you what is going to happen. And it is not because I am wiser than anyone else that I know the secret of your dream, but because God wants you to understand what was in your heart. In your vision, your majesty, you saw standing before you a huge shining statue of a man. It was a frightening sight. The head of the statue was made of fine gold. Its chest and arms were silver, its belly and thighs were bronze. Its legs were iron, and its feet were a combination of iron and baked clay. As you watched, a rock was cut from a mountain, but not by human hands. It struck the feet of iron and clay, smashing them to bits. The whole statue was crushed into small pieces of iron, clay, bronze, silver, and gold. Then the wind blew them away without a trace, like chaff on a threshing floor. But the rock that knocked the statue down became a great mountain that covered the whole earth. That was the dream. Now we will tell the king what it means. Your majesty, you are the greatest of all, all kings. The God of heaven has given you sovereignty, power, strength, and honor. He has made you the ruler over all the inhabited world and has put even the wild animals and birds under your control. You are the head of gold. But after your kingdom comes to an end, another kingdom, inferior to yours, will rise to take your place. After that kingdom has fallen, yet a third kingdom, represented by bronze, will rule the world. Following that kingdom, there will be a fourth one, as strong as iron. That kingdom will smash and crush all previous empires, just as iron smashes and crushes everything it strikes. The feet and toes you saw were a combination of iron and baked clay, showing that this kingdom will be divided. Like iron mixed with clay, it will have some of the strength of iron. But while some parts of it will be as strong as iron, other parts will be as weak as clay. This mixture of iron and clay also shows that these kingdoms will try to strengthen themselves by forming alliances with each other through intermarriage, but they will not hold together, just as iron and clay do not mix. During the reigns of those kings, the, king of heaven will, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed or conquered. It will crush all these kingdoms into nothingness, and it will stand forever. That is the meaning of the rock cut from the mountain, though not by human hands. <coughs> That is the meaning of the rock cut from the mountain, though not by human hands, that crushed to pieces the statue of iron, bronze, clay, silver, and gold. The great God was showing the king what will happen in the future. The dream is true, and its meaning is certain. Then King Nebuchadnezzar threw himself down before Daniel and worshipped him, and he commanded his people to offer sacrifices and burn sweet incense before him. The king said to Daniel, Truly your God is the greatest of gods, the Lord over kings a revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal the secret. Then the king appointed Daniel to a high position and gave him many valuable gifts. He made Daniel ruler over the whole province of Babylon as well as chief over all his wise men. At Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to be in charge of all the affairs of the province of Babylon while Daniel remained in the king's court. All right, well, let's unpack it just a little bit here. Um, here's a representation of the image. Maybe this is something like what uh, King Nebuchadnezzar saw. You notice the head of gold and the chest of silver and the belly and thighs of brass and the legs of iron and the feet made up of iron and clay mixed together. And there you see the rock cut out without hands. Um, Daniel pretty well unpacks all of this for us, except he doesn't yet know the names. He knows the name of Babylon, of course, because that is the current empire. And uh, in chapter 2, in verse 38, he says to King Nebuchadnezzar, you are this head of gold that you saw. And uh, then he tells Nebuchadnezzar what I guess no king really wants to hear, that his kingdom will come to an end, and it will be replaced. But the kingdom that replaces it, this must be some consolation, will be inferior, like silver is inferior to gold. And sure enough, if you go look in the Encyclopedia Britannica, you'll discover that the Persian Empire took the place of the Babylonian Empire and ruled the same territory. Then Daniel says, and that empire also will come to an end, and it will be replaced by another empire. And once again, if you go back to the Encyclopedia Britannica, you discover that sure enough, Persia struggled for a long time against Greece under Alexander the Great. Greece was eventually victorious, and uh, Greece took over from Persia, slaughtered their people, ruled their empire, just as Daniel had said hundreds of years before. But Greece also was replaced by another empire. 
uh, Rome took over from the Greeks and uh, destroyed Greek cities and Greek armies and uh, took over Greek religion and Greek culture. Um, Rome was uh, one of the longest lasting, in fact the longest lasting, of all the ancient empires. Uh, Daniel even says, like iron is stronger than any other metal, um, so this empire, the, the empire that replaces the empire of bronze, will be stronger and it will break all the others in pieces. And uh, once again, you know, you look at the Encyclopedia Britannica and you can see very easily that Rome, the Iron Empire, ruled the earth for hundreds of years after subduing the Greeks. It was actually, of course, in the days of the Roman Empire that Jesus was born and uh, that Jesus was executed and that Jesus was resurrected. The early Christian church was persecuted by the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire provided... Uh, uh, opposition at the beginning, but then eventually the Roman Emperor became a Christian himself. And so for the last couple of centuries of the survival time of the Roman Empire, it was a quasi-Christian empire until its collapse in the 5th century AD. Notice um, in Daniel chapter 2 verse 41 the statement that uh, when the Roman Empire breaks up, uh, it would result in a coalition of different nations uh, represented by the ten toes on the image. As a matter of fact, historians have been able to identify ten uh, tribes that uh, resulted from the breakup of the Roman Empire in Europe. Um, but um, at any rate, the interesting thing is that Daniel predicts that there will never again be another uh, worldwide empire like the Roman Empire, that the resulting nations that uh, come out of the breakup of the Roman Empire will remain partly strong and partly weak. Um, and that, of course, is exactly what happened. We call this the Middle Ages, when Europe was dominated by tribes, all struggling for supremacy over each other, tribes that eventually gave us the nations of Portugal and France and Spain and Germany and Italy and so on. Then Daniel says what is most important about this whole prophecy, in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. And Nebuchadnezzar sees this as the rock that is cut out of the mountain without hands, strikes the image on the feet and it grinds the image to powder and the wind blows it away and then the rock becomes huge and it fills the whole scene. And Daniel explains that this is God's kingdom which takes over from all the earthly kingdoms and becomes the one kingdom that rules everything. One of the significant things about this for us is that we are living down there in the toes, uh, maybe in the toenails. Uh, we are living right down at the very end of this great prophecy that uh, stretched from roughly 600 BC all the way up to the present day. Um, 2,500 or more years that um, this prophecy has been active and has been helping us to understand where we are in the flow of things. That God wasn't surprised by anything like this, that God knew what was going to happen, and uh, that God helps us to get located and to understand that human empires may come and go, but the great outcome is going to be the creation of God's kingdom, and that's an empire that will come, but it will never go. In summary, about 600 BC, God laid out the history of the Middle East for the next 1500 years. All the history books agree. The next event is the second coming. We are, you might say, living in the very toenails of time. And uh, there's not very much of it left if this prophecy is to be believed.